I think you're aware that Haiti, the nation of Haiti, that wonderful, beautiful nation, has been in a state of crisis for some time. And Pastor Leon, I know, will be very grateful for you to consider supporting and sponsoring a child. The cost is less than $2 a day. And this is a difference maker for children in Haiti. I also encourage you to give generously to the work of Haiti Outreach Ministries, but Pastor Leon is asking that we make a regular commitment to pray for Haiti in these days. You'll find prayer cards in the Commons lobby with a simple prayer to pray daily for Haiti in these days. I thank you for doing so. And Pastor Leon, we welcome you, brother. I told him that if you go into the lounge, you'll find a picture of Pastor Leon preaching from this very pulpit. I said, he's the only preacher with a picture on our walls. I don't know what that means, other than he's a great preacher, and I welcome him today. Well, friends, let's now prepare to worship God together. Use these few minutes to remember you're in the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for one another as we prepare to worship God. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice together as God's people. I welcome you to our sanctuary this morning. 
We're here to glorify and praise the Lord. Join me in the call to worship. If you are able to stand, please do so. Friends, let us worship God today, for God is great. God has blessed us with life, with faith, and with community. Let us worship God today, for God is good. God forgives us, encourages us, and loves us. Let us worship God today. Let us worship God. Please remain standing as we offer a prayer of adoration and love to the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all who feel as though they are falling are held by you, and all who are humble and wait for you to exalt them are raised. Even when we feel like we're falling, please help us to remain humble and wait on you. And Lord, you look after every living thing. We are aware that you are the only one who can truly satisfy us and that you will never let us down when we look to you. We say that we love you, Lord. Come, visit us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. if we say that we are without sin, Scripture tells us that we deceive ourselves. And this is why we carve out a time in the midst of our worship of God to repent, because we realize that we are an imperfect people and that we cannot save ourselves through our own efforts, through our own work, but we need God's grace and salvation and the Spirit of God at work transforming our lives. So friends, I invite you to join me in our responsive prayer of confession, and then we will follow that with a moment of silence and personal reflection. Friends, let us pray. Day or night, it is always the right time to come before God. For God already knows what lies in our hearts. Let us offer up our hopes yet unmet. For peace, for reconciliation, for grace. Let us offer up the wrongs we have done. Our greed, our empathy, our meanness. 
Let us offer up the good we have left undone. Forgiving another, offering mercy, choosing compassion. And in silence, let us now offer God the entirety of our hearts. Amen. Friends, Christ did not come into this world to condemn it, but to redeem us, to transform us for those who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And friends, that's my hope for you, that you will know that you are loved by God. So friends, hear the good news. The Lord Jesus Christ died for us, he rose for us, and he reigns in power for us. He prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. We believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We thank and praise the Lord together for our great salvation. Thank you, Primary Choir, for gracing us with the gift of music. If that doesn't bring joy to your heart, you need to go see a cardiologist or something. <laughs> Friends, as we gather in this time of prayer, I do want to remind everybody to, uh, you can go in the narthex at the conclusion of the worship service and sign our letters of well-wishing. We have uh, three going out this week. One is to Mike and Michelle Baker uh, on the death of Mike's mother. Another is going out to Charlene Wright, uh, who's undergoing intestinal surgery. And then another is going to Sue Kershaw, a friend of Becca Neendorf, on the passing of her father. 
We also learned this morning that Randy Gage, the wife of Earl Gage, our business administrator in the church, uh, has passed away. Uh, she passed away uh, yesterday. And so uh, we mourn with Earl, uh, but we also point to the empty tomb. And uh, we are a resurrection people, and we will proclaim that even in the pain and the uncertainty and the despair of death. Christ takes that sting away. Friends, let us now turn to our Lord in prayer. Lord, this morning we ask that you would subtly remind us that we are still in the season of Easter. Help us to live as a people of the resurrection. And we ask this morning that you would give us courage to live and boldly proclaim the promise and the hope of the blood-stained cross and the empty tomb. Lord, some of us have struggled in the days following Easter. Our lives have largely returned to normal. Vacations and times with friends and family have come to an end, and here we are, back to the busyness of our daily lives, of school and work meetings, of extracurricular activities and commitments, lives that are filled with so much anxiety and tension as our calendars and the stress of daily life have returned. Lord, call us to you, even as the anxiety and hopelessness of this world creeps back in. Lord, we ask that you would today remind us that the resurrection isn't merely one day in history, but help us to remember that the resurrection is a way of life. Show us your presence in the tulips that shoot up from the earth and in the blossoms that spring forth from their winter slumber. Remind us of your love as we gather with friends and colleagues and blanket us with your grace like the pollen that dusts nearly everything. Holy God, there is grief. There is pain and suffering in this room. And Lord, we give that pain and that sorrow to you this morning. Comfort Mike and Michelle and the entirety of the Baker family. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Earl and his family as they mourn the passing of a mom and a grandmother. Comfort Sue and comfort the Langerhans, Becker and Salvatera families as they continue to grieve. May they know intimately the hope of your gospel and the good news. So Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones and for those who mourn with patience as loved ones transition to eternal life. Loving God, provide hope to those edging closer to hopelessness and despair. Remind us of your steadfast and unconditional love. Bring peace to those tormented by the demons of addiction and bring peace to those areas of the world that are ravaged by war, civil unrest, and turmoil. We pray for Ukraine and Sudan this morning. And Lord, we especially pray today for the people of Haiti. Lord, bring peace to this land and people being torn apart by war and corruption. Encourage and strengthen the many men, women, and children fighting for their lives. Use ministries like Haiti Outreach Ministries and other organizations to continue proclaiming the good news in the face of uncertainty and violence. Help them as they continue to proclaim the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And pray, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would use these ministries and these Christian people in this land to not only proclaim the gospel, but be used as your hands and your mouthpiece by your Holy Spirit. 
that transforms the old and makes it new. Use your church to witness to the hope of Christ in the midst of conflict, in the midst of hate and pride, and in the midst of sin. We ask, Lord, that you would soften the calloused hearts of those who oppose your will of love for thy neighbor. So, Lord, we pray all of these things, saying together now the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our way of the week this week is number 24, Tell Your Story. And I have to tell you that uh, the inspirer of this particular way is Steve Engel. When we were doing the work on composing and editing our ways, Steve said, we've got to have a way that invites us to be sharing what God has done in our lives, sharing our faith in Christ. Tell your story. God has done and is doing something unique in your life. Has God answered a prayer, provided help, or blessed you? Share it. Ask God for opportunities to share your faith in Christ by word and deeds. So here's the idea for action that I want to give to you, and I'd like to urge you, as we have been doing, to put this one into practice by Tuesday at noon. At the start of each morning this week, think about one thing you're grateful to God for from the previous 24 hours. Got it? Now share it with someone in the course of the day. FBC Morristown, tell your story. We now prepare to bring an offering to God, and this is really what stands at the heart of worship. When we worship God, we are offering all of ourselves to God in so many different forms. Now, in the financial way, so thank you as you offer yourself to God and now to the work of God. I do want to ask you to also, in this time, pray for a 12-year-old boy named Michael McDonald. Michael is from Jamaica, and he has flown here to our area and is, will be at Cooper Hospital on Tuesday morning, he'll undergo surgery to deal with a recurrent infection that he's had. His name is Michael McDonald, 12 years old, from Jamaica. Please pray for him now. So friends, let us joyfully offer ourselves to God and to his work.
Good morning. You know, uh, you do me a disfavor because if I were in Haiti, I would not say good morning. I'll say bonjour. Can I try it? Bonjour. bonjour. Well, make you more comfortable. Good morning again. I bring you greetings from uh, Haiti. All of your friends, those you have seen lately and those you have not seen for many years, but I know your hearts are very, very close to them. Some of you can't wait. When the time will come, you will resume going back to Haiti. And I'll be very happy to welcome you and put you to work. And I'm good at that, and I love to do that. So the time that you are not going to Haiti now is a time to rest and build your muscles, OK? Because uh, work, uh, we'll have work for you to do when you get there. I'm very grateful to see in the audience several Haiti Outreach Ministries board members. And if you don't mind, guys, I know you're not embarrassed, you're not bashful. I will offer you to stand up so that the audience will see our board members and what, their wives and their children who are with us. Uh, well, we thought we'll add to the decor this morning uh, by inviting our friends and board members to, to be with you. And this is just a, an addition to your worship. Thank you very much for the welcome. You know, I just can't help it. I have to say that. I've been waiting for a grandchild for many years. <laughs> Over 30 years, almost 40 years. And now the grandchild is soon coming in August. And you could, I, I'll give you a foretaste, a foretaste of it. Where's my daughter? She's here somewhere. Ah, oh, look at her. Look at that. It's coming in August. Uh, uh, I know some of you don't understand how to act like a grandfather. <laughs> but you're getting there. Uh, talk with Steve. Steve will tell you. Look at the grin in his face because he's enjoying the grandchildren. And I can't wait in August to have a a bigger grin in my face for the granddaughter that is coming. You know, lately you have heard a lot about Haiti, some good, some not so good. I understand that. But let me tell you, you have invested a lot in Haiti over the years. And there are news that you will not hear from CNN there are news that you will not hear from Fox News. There are news you will not even hear from your local newspapers. But I'm here to bring you a little bit up to date to let you know what God has been doing, especially the last year. Last year. Not counting the other two years you have not been going to Haiti, just the last year. You know, right now, as we're speaking, we have four different communities that are meeting and worshiping the Lord. In the four communities, there are over 3,000 people worshiping the Lord right now. That's exciting. Exciting for me. In the midst of all that's going on in Haiti right now, to know there are over 3,000 people worshiping the Lord today. So Easter is still alive. Our God is still alive and well. Right now, I want you to know that the Lord has blessed us with an enrollment of over 2,000 children in our schools. We have four schools now. Training, educating young people, future leaders for Haiti. Because Leon is getting ready to celebrate his 75 years old, and he wants somebody else to take his place. <laughs> and I hope that somebody else is going to be much better than Leon, because 
all that I have, I'm pouring into the lives of these young men and women so that we could have a better future. But all these things are happening because of you. I know we have some sponsors here who are sponsoring children, and I know there are some who are thinking about doing it right after the church service. We need you because of the 2,000 children who are enrolled in our school, there are 517 of them who are without sponsors. So think about that. We need you to make Haiti a better place to live in the future. Would you know, five days a week we open our water purification system to share clean water to all four communities that we serve. Every day we distribute over 2,000 gallons of water in the communities. Water is life. In clean water, it's even abundant life. And that's what we are about to do in Haiti. With a country of over less than 5% of the population will go to college. I'm very happy to let you know that because of your participation in the ministry, we have over 300 students who are going to college right now. And you know, it's already been said, we have now doctors, we have lawyers, we have uh, bankers, we have uh, nurses, we have school teachers. As a matter of fact, we have 18 of our former students who are involved in the four schools that we have. All four schools, the principals are former students. You are doing a very good job in Haiti. And I'm very grateful to you and to God for that collaboration, for that partnership. I cannot go on and on tell you all the grandiose reports, and there are much more, many more than what I share with you, but Stuart told me, Leon, you are invited to preach. And you only have 15 minutes, including the report. So guys, <laughs> and I want to come back. If I make Stuart mad, guess what? I won't be invited back. So the message is going to be short and sweet. Short and sweet. On Acts, the Apostle, Acts chapter 26, just a verse 19, I'd like to share with you the context. Paul, because he was preaching the resurrection, he had a tough time preaching the resurrection to the audience that he was sharing with. But he had a personal encounter with God, with Jesus Christ, on the road of Damascus. No one is going to tell him that Jesus Christ was not alive because he had his own personal experience. No one can change that. He set about to preach the resurrection and because of that, they set out to arrest them, kill them, and give him a hard time. But he will not stop because he had his own personal conviction about Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful when you have your own experience with someone? And to know that you said, I know in whom I believe it and I'm persuaded. Nothing is going to change that. I'm mean, persuaded. He's going to be with me. Walk with me. Be alive with me. Because he has promised that. O King Agrippa, said Paul, I was not disobedient 
into the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. The vision of Paul, as you know, he had an encounter face to face with Jesus Christ. And the vision of Paul may not be your vision, but I am a firm believer that every single one of us has our own vision about God. He talks with you. He walks with you. He knocks you to be more like Jesus. He encourages you to get involved in your community. He encourages you to be involved in your own church. And for many of you, he has been talking with you for months or for years to do something. Be involved. And maybe he will take a Haitian all the way from Haiti to remind you that he's been talking with you. It's about time to say, I was not disobedient. I'm not going to keep on disobeying what I know God wants me to do with my life. When you say yes to God, according to the context of this text, I see there are three things that happen when we say yes to God, to whatever it is that he's talking to you about, whether to be a better grandfather, a better husband, a better wife, a better student, a better citizen, whatever it is. I have no question that he is talking to every single one of us about something that he wants us to do. Maybe something that you're already doing, but he wants you to be more engaged, more committed, whatever it is. Yours is yours, mine is mine, but we need each other to make the whole. The church here will never be a time in his life that needs you more to be involved. When you are involved, like Paul, I was not disobedient into the heavenly vision, the first thing, I feel like you are liberated. You are set free. Because nothing is more annoying when you know you have something to do and you are putting it off. It's annoying. You know this is something that is in your mind and your heart to do, and you are putting it off. It reduces your life. You're not as excited as you could be when you find your niche. That's what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. I was not disobedient into the heavenly vision. not talking about me but let me tell you i've been in the ministry for 50 years now you know in my other life what i'll be doing serving god because that's where i find joy that's where i find peace that's where i feel i'm liberated i'm happy to know that god is using me and as a good Presbyterian, you know that. Why did God give you life? To glorify his name. If you don't do that, you're not Presbyterian. And if, you're not, if you don't do that, you're not a creature in the likeness of God. God is busy all the time. As representative of God, we need to do likewise. So you want to be free? You want to have an exciting life? Find something to do, whatever it is. And wherever it is, set your mind, that's what I want to do. Or else, life could be miserable. The second thing I find in the context that if you say yes to God, you have a global view of life. You know, 
It's not fun living when everything is about you. <laughs> Believe me. Life is not fun when it's all involved around you. Life is fulfilling and joyful in her purpose when you know God first, author second, and I'm third. Because whenever you live for somebody else, husband live for the wife, wife live for the husband, church members live for the church, and church live for the... There's, there's excitement. I'm already excited and I have plans for my granddaughter. <laughs> that she hasn't come yet. But I'm excited. Why? Because I'm thinking about the daughter. Ask a newly born. I watched my daughter yesterday. She changed the way she walks. She walks to protect the baby inside her room. She's not living for herself anymore. And life is fine. So when you say yes to God, you have a global view. It's not about you, it's about people. That's why Paul said from Damascus, the Lord appeared to me. I set aside to talk with Jesus in Damascus, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all over. Because God is God for all people, no matter where they are. I was very excited yesterday as I was giving a tour here. And I found out with your own church, your own facility, there are three different nations are using your facility. Say, so yes, that's where it should be. You not only have a global view, you're going out, those who are around you are welcome here. Use the building, no matter what nationality you are. Wow, I am so excited. Time. Why are you clicking, eh, clock? I wish I was in Haiti. <laughs> Time doesn't matter, but here I understand. But you have to have a global view. That's why Paul said, I'm indebted to the Jew, I'm indebted to the Greek, I'm indebted to everyone because I know God created everyone for his people. And that's the mission of the church, to reach out to all. And when a church does that, that's what? Right. There's excitement, there's life, there's joy. Third but not least, when you say yes to God, like the Haitian we said, touch your belt. It's not going to be having your best dessert every day. When you say yes to God, you deny self. You live for God. Because things are not going to always be your way. In Haiti, right now, because we say yes to God, all the things that you hear that's going on in Haiti, but every day is a brand new day. Every hour counts. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Because today is what you have. Tight your belt. And that's why Paul teaches us that because he set out to preach the resurrection, he had all kinds of enemies, but yet, I like what he said in chapter 20 to the elders. I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but one thing I know, they need to hear the word of God. Even if I died on my way to Jerusalem, I'm going to go and preach the word. And he did. And that happened to him. Almost killed him. But he said, I have a mission, and I have to accomplish that mission. Friends, what it is? When you say yes to God, calling in your life, no matter where the call may be, and no matter what the call may be, it might be to babysit your grandchildren. That's a calling. It might be to assist your church. That's a calling. Maybe to say yes 
count on me, Pastor Stewart. I'm going to be here Sunday. You want me to teach the children? You want me to sweep the benches? Count on me. Whatever it is, do it. And you feel you find fulfillment in your life. When you say yes to God, know there are other people like you. You need to reach to them so that they too could say yes to God and the world will be a better world to live in. When you say yes to God, know that it's not going to be easy. But it's worth it. I'm happy when I see a couple of young people in Haiti who could be great gangsters, gangs, I mean bad guys. But when I see them serving communion on Sunday, <laughs> you know how I feel? Say, yes, God, I'm glad I say yes to you. Look at this guy. He's serving communion. He could have been the worst guys in our society. But because we said yes to God, we preach the resurrection, his life has changed. You could do the same. God is no respect of person. What he did to Leon, he'll do it to everyone's friend. All we have to say, what is it? Yes, Lord. God bless you.